Welcome everybody. Uh, serverless in real life, a case study in the travel industry. We are very much aware that we're probably the last session that you're going to do today, so we can either decide to drag it along or rush you through it, but we'll see how, <laughs> how, how well you respond to our jokes. So, all right. All right, well, I'm James Daniels. I'm an SDK engineer on the Firebase team. And uh, here I am in the pictures. I had a little bit more facial hair there, but yeah. as you can see, we're very serious people. Yeah, and to make sure I, we added the arrow so that you don't confuse them for the pineapple. And, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Stefan Hogendorn. I'm the chief geek and CTO at Clouder, uh, Clouder CTS. And I'm also a Google developer expert for uh, Google Cloud Platform and Firebase. And yes, there's arrows uh, pointing to me as well because some people might mistake me for the pineapple. Um, anyways, so imagine that you want to go on a trip of a lifetime. For most Europeans, that probably means going to uh, Australia and New Zealand. Anybody from Australia or New Zealand, just imagine that everything that we say about your country basically applies to you going to Europe or whatever exotic uh, destination you, that you want to go to. But just imagine that you want to go, to, that you go uh, on a trip of a lifetime. Um, we have a customer that has a lot, of, a, a lot of consumers or customers that really have that dream. And that, that dream, that, one, that once in a lifetime, oh, take me to that wonderful place and provide me with that vacation of a, of a lifetime. And so they're really, as they say, they're in the industry of making dreams come true. Uh, they're specialized in, in, in Australia and New Zealand travels. That's why I mentioned if you're from th those areas, just imagine that we're doing the other way around. And just keep in mind, it's pretty cool, but it's not as cool as your country. Although, we don't have stuff that tries to kill you. New Zealand, that's where the hobbits are from, right? Absolutely. The, yeah. I, need to, I need to go see yeah. that. I'm not sure if those try and, try and kill you as well, but <laughs> I might have to rewatch the movie. Anyways, so now imagine that you have to make those, those, dream, those dreams come true. Um, Travel Essence needs quite a bit of systems and staff to do that. It's not like they're organizing vacations for like one family. It's quite a few families that they're trying to, to, to deal with. Um, so they need quite a bit of systems, quite a bit of staff to do that. Uh, they need to scale up because uh, they're doing a pretty good job at what they do. Uh, they've got their radio commercials going on. They're now in different, uh, different countries in Europe. So they're really scaling. And that kind of brings, brings other challenges as well. And um, so that, that's, that makes it a bit more difficult to you know, make dreams come true. So. Without diving into uh, those dreams and uh, all the architecture and all that, let's first try and see how we got started with this customer and, and how we introduced them into serverless. It's actually a funny story. Um, the, CEO, the CEO of uh, Travel Essence called Andrew Morton, he always tells us that, hey, we're always looking uh, to, enhance uh, to enhance our systems to, so that we can ensure that the people that are in our company actually speak to people. Because if you make dreams come true, well, we're all, most of us are, have some engineering background, so for us it's probably dreams coming true by speaking to computers. But if you're in the travel industry, it may, usually means that you uh, want to speak to other people that actually tell you where it's cool and where you need to go. So uh, that's, that's what their purpose is, speak to people, deal with people. Now, if you're dealing with people, that's, uh, that's pretty cool, but just m imagine that you're, um, that you're a customer of theirs and uh, you're talking to an agent, and you're talking about your vacation, and the first thing that the agent goes like, oh yeah, by the way, can you tell me your it itinerary number or your customer number? You know, if you're doing a trip of a lifetime, you want to feel special, you don't want the agent to go like, who are you? Um, so, you know, it gets kind of boring or annoying, and then you might have somebody else in your party or in your family go joining you and sending them emails and saying, oh yeah, uh, I know that we're going to Somewhere in, somewhere in Australia, but can we also go to that other place? And oh, can we also see um, you know, more animals that kill us? And then the agent goes like, who are you? And then somebody else from your, from your party also goes like, oh yeah, and I want to go there, and can you tell me a bit more about this or that? So before you know it, either you, I, either the customer or the agent will go like, what am I, what am I doing? Why am I, who, who, who are these people? Or if you're the customer, like, why don't they understand who I am? Uh, and why don't they make my dream come true? So that kind of, kind of, it's kind of annoying, I guess. Yeah. So what they asked us first thing to do is, you know, can you get, get, can you help us and get a grip of the communications that we have with our customer? So fortunately, the customer uh, at Travel Essence was, was already on, on, on G Suite. So what we did is we took uh, the email API, API uh, for, for G Suite, um, ran a little program on App Engine that would extract 
emails from, from the environment. Uh, we would then feed those emails through the natural language processing API, uh, apply some other stuff as well. Obviously, you can do uh, regular expressions and all that to, to, to see um, uh, travel, travel IDs and some other stuff that, we, that you can do programmatically, but we also needed to be able to interpret what was in the emails and really try and understand how, who, who this relates to. Or to, or to what travels or what travel parties the emails related to. So we use the NLP API with some with some with some extra uh, secret sauce. Um, we then took all that information, put it back in BigQuery, and made sure that the staff really had a, a better view and a better understanding of who they were talking to. Now, when we delivered that, the customer went like, "Oh, this is great. This is a, this is this is pretty cool. Uh, now tell us what servers that we need to install this on." And we're like, uh, "Well, you don't." So um, the customer like, okay, then where does it run? And we had to explain to them uh, serverless. So the cool thing is we can now say, hey, look, Francis, no servers. <laughs> um, so doing serverless or do, doing the serverless is not something that we did accidentally. Like, oh, hey, let's try this. But it is part of the philosophy that we have as a company that when you, when you try and build a solution, the first thing that you do is you try and do this Serverless. You start with serverless um, because if you start with serverless, one of the one of the very nice things about it is that you can more or less only focus on the functionality that you try and deliver. And uh, we've been doing this for for like ages. I've been I myself have been doing App Engine since what 11 years? Has it been been like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. So and that was for me like the first step or the first the the first item that that I recognized as 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 uh, as being serverless, and that's why. Uh, for serverless, I use the App Engine icon. James had some objections, but hey. <laughs> Once again, the, f the cool thing is you just focus on, on the functionality. Now, it might sometimes be that you try and run something on serverless, and it, or you, that you want to do something on serverless, and it just doesn't work on serverless. Uh, you need to use that one specific API, or the customer wants you to use that one specific library, and that just doesn't, th that just doesn't run on, on serverless. Because of the language, because of the time it takes, and, and things like that. So what we then do is we look at uh, containers, we look at uh, container engine and, and things like that, and run our code there. And if we really can't run it in, in containers, we'll go, to, we'll go to VMs and then try and fix it on VMs. If it doesn't, go, if it doesn't work there, yeah, we're not going to run it on an AS400 or something, so we are just try and redesign it. The cool thing is that if you take this approach, you, s you always, or most of the time, you'll end up with an application that is serverless, and once again, you can focus on the functionality. Um, and also the cool part is that if you start from the other end with virtual machines, you'll hardly ever make it into serverless. So that's, uh, that's a nice uh, thing to know as well. Now, I'm very passionate about serverless. I'm um, so passionate that I even have like a very crude statement here. If you're offended by that, cool. <laughs> um, my statement is that if you're not building uh, serverless, you're robbing your customers of innovation. Because what you'll end up doing is you'll end up uh, providing your customer with a whole bunch of app, or, and whether your customer is an internal customer or it's an external customer because you're like a, a Google partner like we are. Uh, but if you, if you don't do serverless, you're robbing them of innovation because you ask them to spend a lot of time on maintaining systems, understanding technology, and all the customer really wants you to do is focus on functionality because that's where the cool stuff is. Quoting yourself is a real power move. Thought leader. I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do with, uh, so to, to, to put it in, into context, uh, this was the, the, the landscape that the customer was looking at. So coming back from a, or I, doing something serverless was kind of new to them. At least they felt like that, but uh, they already had some stuff in the, in the cloud. So they were using G, G Suite, they had a financial application that they were running in the cloud. But the primary systems, that, the stuff that really makes their organization what it is and enables them to sell, to, to create for you those, those magical the, uh, travels, um, that's really all about legacy systems. So they had a legacy itinerary system, they ran an MySQL. Fortunately, they had, a, uh, they had a bit of an insight in putting that on Cloud SQL, but that was like the only well, serverless thing they did. Um, they had PHP application logic running on some servers. They had third-party API calls running on servers, and a lot of that. So it was really a legacy infrastructure. Now, what we did, because we showed them that we could do ser stuff serverless and that we, uh, we could really focus on the, on the functionality, they also were like, hey, can you help us and maybe replace some of, some of our outdated uh, legacy features and replace that with new uh, uh, with new features and new applications, and maybe run that uh, on that on that serverless stuff as well. 
So that's what we started doing. We hooked up, once again, App Engine, our faithful workhorse, um, and hooked it up into their uh, legacy I, uh, itinerary system, uh, started getting data out of that, and then putting that into, uh, into Firebase and into, into Firestore. The reason for that is because it was easy, it has a, uh, it has a fairly easy API, and yeah, you guessed it, you guessed it it's serverless. So, uh, and it really allows us to build, yeah, basically an, uh, an entire application. So. so, if you look at that architecture, right, this is that modern three-tier architecture, right? Uh, this is something that we're uh, aiming to achieve, especially for those customers that we're trying to migrate into the cloud, right? So we have these three tiers, this great academic separation of concerns, right? We have our uh, presentation layer with our orchestration gateways, CDN, and then our clients also on that side. They all fit in that bucket. Uh, we then have our application logic, our code servers, um, hopefully on the cloud, but they probably have stuff also still on-prem. And this is also where they, the layer which they call out to third parties. And then, of course, the great data tier and uh, your DBAs manage this and it's sacred and no one touches the database without permission, right? Um, so this also fits this model, right? So you have your app, you're talking to the compute, serverless, hopefully. Um, you're doing that through, you know, load balancers and proxies. And then that compute is then, you know, it's in a trusted environment and it has administrative access to your database. It's talking to, say, Cloud Firestore. Um, I'm a, as someone on the Firebase team, I'm a little biased, but <laughs> I think Firestore is a very awesome NoSQL database and gives you some strong guarantees, which are very cool. So once we get into Firestore, one of the cool things here is actually Firestore is an event emitter within Google Cloud. So writes to Firestore are an event emitter. They can actually be uh, monitored by Cloud Functions. Um, you can also monitor Cloud Storage buckets. Um, if you're using Firebase Authentication or CICP, you can monitor user creation events, stuff like that. And when this event happens, when this event is sourced, it can actually fire up a Cloud Function. And Cloud Function, I'm JavaScript developer, so I write Node.js scripts there. So I write Node code, and the function execute this. It's a serverless uh, infrastructure, and it spins up these workers on demand to fulfill these event sources. And if you imagine, this Cloud Function could then start writing back to Firestore, right? So you write data in one part of the database, there's maybe a mutation, a side effect, it calls a third-party API, another GCP product, and it takes that results and does stuff with it and writes it back into Firestore. And then, you know, the next time the application like reloads the data or something like that, the server fetches it, you have all the caching and, you know, typical stuff. But it's starting to get reactive on that back end. Now we can take this a step further, right? Now that we're farming that logic out to reactive uh, responses to the database writes, why don't we take it that step further? We no longer need that application server. So this is where we can start you know, testing the wire, waters on this native Firestore architecture, right? So the client-side application, whether it be an iPhone, Android, or web application, directly communicates to Firestore. No intermediary servers, no lo load balancers. It sends its data writes and reads directly to the database. And when any, any mutations happen, a cloud function can tri trigger and then write back to Firestore. And the cool thing about this is you get the superpowers of Firebase, right? So you have a cloud function, respond to this event. It changes something in the database, and the client is listening. Right. With Firebase, when you make a query to the database, it can be, but by default, it's not a one-time operation. Right. You're listening to snapshots. So you query, and it actually creates a persistent socket to the database. So when the data in the database changes, the client gets that in real time. All the other clients listening to that point in the database 
get those streams in real time. 10, 100 milliseconds, somewhere around there. And it creates this magical real time experience where you no longer have this pull to refresh model that you see in a lot of applications. Um, another benefit of going down this path and using the Firebase SDKs to access your uh, data is that we've actually written uh, offline capabilities into the application. You don't have to do anything. So I showed that very academic three-tiered web architecture. And there's a lie there, right? That clean separation of concerns breaks down when your application hits production. So that database tier, maybe you need to make it more performant. So you add a Redis and start caching things. And well, now you have a database at the application le layer. And then you need offline capability. So you add SQLite or local storage for web applications. And now again, you have data on the presentation tier. And you need to worry about keeping those in sync and contention and you know, detecting online versus offline. And that's a lot of work, a lot of code, and a lot of places where that theoretical separation of concerns breaks down and you get bugs. Fortunately, we've done that work for you. And ultimately, this empowers your developers to focus on the business logic of your application, build things and ship things faster, and hopefully have a smaller ops team. So what powers this, right, is breaking down this wall. The idea is that your data, data storage, data access, you know, pushing things to the database, reading things out, it, it matters to every one of these tiers, right? Uh, the application, the presentation, and of course the data layer. So the access is, is co-equal between all of these. Um, and then you get the, the Firebase SDK and the tight integrations with Google Analytics and the Firebase authentication. And then of course, cloud functions to respond as side effects. Uh, we jokingly call it side effects as a service on the team. And ultimately, you know, when you write, they do operations right back and that streams to the client, creating this magical experience. Now, this is where I'll talk to a lot of developers that are used to doing things through load balancers and API servers. And I start saying, interact directly with the database, the production database, interact directly with it from your client side application. And I always get this little horrified look and I know what's coming and they're saying, how can this be secure at all, right? I'm just giving out the keys to my database to any iPhone app, everyone who visits my website. And the key here is this integration with Firebase authentication and our security rules product. So with security rules, you can actually write rules that limit the operations on any path in your database, any document, to some sort of condition. And you can look at the user doing that, the keys associated with them. And you can even look in other places in the database and make sure, oh, they have permission to this and that. All right. So what we really have, what you're basically saying is that for us, doing that serverless thing was like one serverless step for us. It's a giant leap in architecture. It's very awesome. Yes, I quoted somebody else <laughs> this time. Right. Um, so what is nice is that you really put that that, that native Firestorm model that, that that as you described it. It really works for us, and it kind of takes away the complexity that we might otherwise have. You know, creating. Um, creating a REST API on our database and having to go th through all those motions and servicing that and, 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 and things like that. So really, the app engine that we have, or the app engine application that we have in the application is not only serve it, serve doing some work to get data out of, the, uh, out of the legacy system. So that's pretty awesome. So we can actually start to make the application a bit simpler. And then by uh, having the client directly connecting with, the, um, w w with Firestore or with, with Firebase, we have that, that that interaction, and we allow the users, uh, because we have that connection, uh, um, the, the, the native connection, it allows us to build an application where 
uh, if users are working on an itinerary uh, together, and that happens because somebody might be book booking a, uh, a hotel, somebody else might be booking a car, or, or some event that people might want to go to, you actually see the updates appear on your screen straight away. And it actually saves our, our customer, or the, 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 the agents at our customer, quite a bit of time, and it allows them to better interact with the system, but also, if they're on the phone with the customer, be sure that they have those real-time and real-life updates, no matter what the system is doing. Even if the system in the background is booking uh, airplane tickets or whatever, they get the latest information, and that's really awesome. So um, it allows us to do, to do a bit more volume handling of itinerary events. Uh, it doesn't uh, cause all sorts of task explosions where people have to do all sorts of, thing, all sorts of extra things, like hit extra buttons or actu actu do actual work. It really helps the customer to focus on what is important in functionality. And for us, it also helps us to focus on what the customer really finds important. Does it, uh, you might have no noticed it, there's a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you know, if we're talking about, uh, one of the very nice things is that we're, we're now using functions to, to handle all sorts of things, and the customer is actually quite, quite happy with that. And we're, uh, we're looking into, you know, getting some of the other systems that they're integrating with and, and get that going as well. So they've got the financial system. So, hey, why not, you know, use Firebase uh, Cloud Functions or use Cloud Functions to actually start writing information back into the financial system or maybe do some of the flight bookings. By the way, the finance system is actually pretty cool because it has a pretty good REST API. The car rental uh, system, uh, because uh, most of the time when you're in Australia and New Zealand, you want to drive around and things like that. That, that has pretty cool API as well. It's a SOAP API, it's not as cool as the REST API, but hey, that's still, still pretty good. The flight booking system, that was a bit more, eh, a bit more difficult, it's a bit more traditional, but hey, we can, we can deal with that. You know, cloud functions are cool, we can do everything with that, excellent. So, you know, we then, it might hit a snag where we might need to use some of that container stuff that I talked earlier about, so we do everything serverless. If we can't do serverless, we'll hit containers, because in the other external sources, some of the things that they want to do, uh, because as you can imagine, travel is quite expensive, uh, and a, a, you, a, as a travel agency, you might have to make uh, payments to, to, a, to, to uh, hotels and, and things like that uh, up front. So uh, they have some, some fund hedging that they do. And the cool thing is that the bank that they're doing that with is very advanced and sends them a PDF once in a while that says, oh yeah, the, the, the exchange rate for the, for, the, for the Australian dollar, or the, what is it, New Zealand dollar? Um, is this and that, and we have to get that from the uh, from the from, from the PDF. But hey, yeah, that's yep. that's not too bad. Now, now it sounds like you know you're you've touched on a couple of points here. Like functions is great. Yep. I love functions. It has a tight integration with Firebase, but you know you mentioned Container Engine, maybe some harder workloads you put through that because functions has a timeout and it's not really meant for that. But you know I, I'm concerned about some of these other APIs too. Uh, so, you know, I threw functions at you, but let's talk a little bit about functions and how they're designed and the workloads that they support. So, first and foremost, functions is at least once, right? Cloud functions are designed to reliably, definitely do something when you have a right to your database, when a file's uploaded. You really want that job to occur. Now, I'm not a theoretical computer scientist. I wasn't that diligent in school, but I work with a bunch of them. And from my understanding with distributed systems, having you know, anything less than at least once, maybe exactly once, that's a very hard problem to do within a distributed system. So maybe you have a network partition show up, these workers are now out of sync, and they can't tell if they're doing each other's jobs. So cloud functions to ensure that a job occurs will trigger more than once, right? Maybe you get duplicate fires. So one of the things that we always tell people is make sure the side effects in cloud functions are item potent. So they're also designed for on-demand provisioning, right? These servers go from zero to infinity, right? They'll scale to meet your workload and the data enter their, entering the system but Cloud Functions is designed for database writes and storage uploads and, and end user things, basically, right? So a user clicks a button or uploads a file. And these kind of, you know, maybe they batch and maybe it gets, you have busy parts of the day, but ultimately these are kind of random events and 
not very predictable otherwise. And they're designed for immediate fulfillment. Since these are for end user response, when a, a result comes into the system, when, when an action happens, we want the side effect to happen as quickly as possible, right? Uh, maybe one of the, the functions is busy. Um, we don't want to interrupt that. We don't want to limit its resources. So cloud functions, the concurrency per worker is one. We give it that job, the full resources of the container. So if you have a bunch of events coming in, it has to spin up new functions. Um, and you can have, if you imagine, if you get a huge burst of activity, maybe you'll have a bit of a backlog. And the idea there is just to get it done as quickly as possible and respond to those. So going back to this case, right? You know, if you've worked with Stripe or some of the modern payment providers, they're great because they're cloud native APIs and they have item potency tokens. So you could use your Firebase event ID or your document ID to make sure that you don't double bill a client. If we're talking legacy APIs, they're probably more meant for this transactional centralized world. So without an item potency token, we double bill your customers. Right. Not good, not good. Um, maybe this flight booking API is a traditional API, but you know, very big enterprise. So maybe there's really harsh quotas on that. Right? I'm not allowed to query their API more than once every 30 seconds because they don't want people gaming the system. So if we have a lot of events come in at once, we could get throttled or banned, which is not a good experience for our users. This SOAP API, right? Uh, maybe again, quotas, but it being SOAP, maybe they're expecting batch data, right? They're saying, don't hit our API more than once every 15 seconds, but feel free to batch a bunch of requests in one. Cloud Functions isn't really suited for that. It's immediate action, it's stateless, right? It's not gonna fit well in this world. And then, you know, you mentioned the other sources, these PDFs getting sent to you from the bank that include the, you know, the, 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 the conversion rate yeah. between currencies. Like, that's a lot of data. Container Engine's definitely good there. But I imagine that that could be rapid fire, right? You're getting, when currencies fluctuate, they fluctuate rapidly. You'll get a lot of events from the system all at once. And, you know, again, that, that, that stepping function where things spin up, not necessarily great for this use case. So now you're backing things up in your back end. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to feel a bit like your emojis. I'm like, you know, it's... <laughs> I was quite happy. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're going to do, do a talk about serverless. And oh, yeah, I'm really cool. And he basically now tells me that <laughs> I'm not that cool. Well, the cool thing is now, by the way, that uh, for, for the Dutch people, you'll recognize this as Delft Blau or Delft Blue. <laughs> for the non-Dutch people, just look it up on, 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 on the internet. Uh, you'll get it. But you know, I know that this, the, the, this is a whole bunch of products that Google has. But you know, we, we like our cloud functions. and, and but how do we solve this? So, so cloud functions do tie in great with Firebase, right? There are native event sourcing, but there are a lot of products. So, uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, haha, data flow. So, cloud data flow is a streaming processing engine, right? It's meant to take either batches of data or large streams of data and handle them in a functional model. So I'm a functional programming nerd, so I really like this product. It's fully managed and no ops, so it does tick your box of serverless. Um, the provisioner is centralized, but the workers are decentralized serverless that can spin them up. And because it's meant for event sources, it can be a little bit smarter about provisioning. And it's based off the open source Beam uh, model. So comparing it to Cloud Functions, right? I mentioned Cloud Functions is at least once. You can have double fires. Now, Cloud Dataflow, how this differs, is the events that come into Cloud Dataflow are first passed through a Bloom filter. So it's going to filter out those duplicates. And then when it spins up the workers, you have deduplicated data. So because this is exactly once, 
you can safely handle side effects without the need of figuring out item potency. Cool, so we can just book that flight once instead of sending the family Jones like six times on the same flight to Australia. Yeah, yeah, cool. you, you would not want to, when a network shard appears, bill your customer for six tickets to Australia. No, probably not. That's no. a little pricey. All right, so this is adding to the dream. Uh, so with Cloud Functions, you have this on-demand provisioning, right? This is meant for sort of random user-generated events, and it's sort of a stepper function, right? It'll go, do I have enough workers to fulfill this? Maybe I'll spin up a new one as load increases, and then they'll slowly spin down. Whereas data flow coming from data processing pipeline and ETL pipeline tool it's going to have more predictable scaling. It can actually look at the inflow and the outflow of the system, how long the jobs are taking, the error rates, and it can calculate the number of workers it needs, and it's a highly concurrent model. So it's going to be able to get those jobs done as quickly as possible while also balancing cost for you. Cool. So we really get a predictable pipeline, no backlogs and all that, and the customer really gets to well, ha almost have like a, 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 a certain reassurance in, 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 in delivery or uh, execution of actions yeah. without having to spend like a ton of money on it. Cool. Yeah, more predictable cool. cost, cool. definitely. Cool. And then Cloud Functions is designed for this immediate, as quick as possible, I'll spin up new servers if need be, fulfillment, right? Um, whereas data flow being for data batching and processing and this functional programming model, I can run filters on my code, I can group them, I can sort them, I can do windows. So I can say, batch this data by you know, five minute increments or give me a sliding 10 minute window. And that way we can be a lot more intelligent in the data that we take and we put into our stores and process in the rest of the, the system so that we don't overwhelm our system. Excellent. That really helps us with you know dealing with the car API where we can only do so many uh, requests per, uh, per per time uh, per, per time unit. Uh, batch those things. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a little discount on that. Wonderful. Cool. And the, and also those PDFs from the bank, right? Those right. the interchanges and the the currency transfer rates are gonna change rapidly. And if you're working with something like Firestore, um, there's a quota, right? So. There are max rates at which you can mutate your data over time. So like in Firestore, you can't write to a document at a sustained rate more than once per minute. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so now extrapolating that into this, this uh, architecture that we, that we wrote out. So now we have cloud functions and we're actually going to pipe this data to Cloud PubSub because Cloud PubSub is the, the system that works really well with data flow. So it can actually ingest events from that. That's its stream processing capabilities, whereas Cloud Functions is tightly integrated into the, the, the Firestore event sources. So we just pipe that along. Uh, now data flow can do any batching. It can do any filtering, sorting, and it can also do these side effects that you know might be legacy systems. Uh, from there, it outputs the data to PubSub again. And then we can actually have, the cool thing about PubSub is we can have multiple subscribers to a PubSub stream. So we can have two different cloud functions, one listening to the PubSub stream and writing back to Firestore, and then one listening to the PubSub stream and writing any relevant information we want back to BigQuery. So, that way, if either one of these has load problems or errors, they're not going to affect the other. Cool, excellent. By the way, to be honest, uh, I was kind of joking with, oh man, um, our my, my pre the, the, presenta the, the presentation is going to pieces because we did it wrong. Uh, no customers were hurt creating the system. This is actually the architecture that we deliver. It has. Uh, it, it, we took care of all the. Uh, 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 we took care of the item potency. We took care of the the batching. We took care of all the stuff that we needed to do to make a really scalable and reliable system for this customer. And what is what is well, sort of funny. If, depending if you if you were the IT guy, probably not. But 
Um, since they are in the business of selling, selling travel and they're selling dreams, and they're not in the business of, of selling IT or creating IT, uh, uh, running IT systems, what they actually did is they were using the system, they're now able to serve more customers uh, without having even, with, with, with even less uh, IT people running them. Um, it's actually quite extreme. The number of IT people that, that they have is exactly zero. <laughs> so that's um, uh, the IT guy, by the way, got a great new position uh, somewhere else, and we're we, we're working with him very closely on that. But the real the really nice thing is it really helps us, and it really helped the customer create a solution in which they can run th their business, and they can run their business at scale. Because as I said before, they're not doing this for for one or two customers; they're doing uh, qu quite a, quite a few million uh, euros uh, per year uh, selling uh, selling travel. So. Now, with all this, uh, with all this in place, we now have a very strong and very structured environment that we can use. And maybe it's time to also look at some of the future developments that we're that we're seeing that we can do. Um, so, just to kind of reiterate where we're coming from, so we helped the, the the initial customer question was, "Hey, help us communicate," and we we use that to introduce serverless to them. Uh, we then started adding more complex workloads to, to, to their environment or taking care of some of the more complex workloads they had in their legacy system and moved them into a serverless environment. Uh, we integrated with some of the legacy systems they had and we really made the system more robust so that it could handle uh, a higher volume of traffic. Now, with that uh, in place, one of, the few, one of the future steps that we're going to take is obviously connect to the consumer, so connect to their customer and make sure that the custom, that customer has an even better experience after the booking process. And uh, what we'll also do is we're going to optimize the systems as we go along. Because one of the really cool things about the Google Cloud Platform and the serverless operations that we use is that there's a constant change and a constant update of those, te of those technologies, ever increasing and ever allowing for, for better integrations and better optimizations of code and better uh, developer work streams as well. So one of the things, one of the things that we're going to do uh, up next is uh, we're going to optimize the, the, the container-based um, uh, development workflow. So right now, uh, the, the for the for the developers, the the, the container workflow was slightly different. The container development workflow was slightly different from the serverless workflow, where you're just creating uh, your cloud functions and all that. Doing the, doing the containers was a bit more difficult. And with the announcement of uh, Google Cloud Run that was that was made uh, this morning. Uh, we'll be able to kind of align the development process of uh, the developers when they have to do the containers, align that a bit better with the uh, development uh, workflows that they have um, using Cloud Run. Yeah, and definitely uh, Cloud Run is really cool technology. Um, if you haven't gone through any sessions today, do sit in the keynotes tomorrow, and you know there's going to be plenty of sessions coming up about this container technology. Yeah, definitely, definitely check it out. And also, and he he can say it, but I can because he's on our NDA, and I'm <laughs> well, I'm I'm sort of as well. But um, there's a lot of cool stuff coming coming up in the in in the Firebase uh, realm as well that will really help people doing uh, serverless comp uh, serverless application development, or not even in, only in the Firebase realm, but also in in in, a, in the bigger Google Cloud realm. Uh, with some of, uh, with a, with, a f with a lot of cool stuff that they'll they'll be announcing over the over the next uh, days and some of the stuff at I/O as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, one of the other things that we're going to do uh, is we're going to optimize the insights and be more predictive on the workloads. So obviously we have some prediction and we we have optimized workloads uh, coming from from data flow, but they also have their own workflows and their their their, their own data loads. Uh, that we need to deal with. And as you might have seen in the image before, that we're writing a lot of the information or a lot of the process information, we're writing that back to, to, to BigQuery. Now, the reason why we're doing that is because it will allow us to create more predictable workloads, uh, get a better understanding of their customers, get a better understanding of the travels that they're selling, getting a better understanding of their success. So getting that information, you can imagine, they'll be able to even more efficiently run uh, their operations. And last but not least, we're going to build a customer-facing application using uh, using Flutter. Uh, the nice thing about Flutter is, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's a uh, it's a way of writing uh, or using one code base and, and write an application that will run on both Android and iOS, and it will really help the customer to to re to have that that extended uh, interaction with their customers uh, while the customer is traveling. And since we can use, as James explained, that native connection to the database and still be sure that we have the full security in there, you can imagine that it will, make, it will be a lot easier to write those applications. Also, because Flutter really nicely in integrates with the whole Firebase uh, product. Because Firebase obviously has its roots in mobile development, 
and you can kind of see where, th where this is going. So these are a few very exciting uh, updates that we're going to do. And it, it's all updates that will really fit the, the development flow that our developers have, the, the, the workflows and the, the, the technical understandings that they have. So we're quite excited about this. Definitely. Uh, so it sounds like you have a, a great setup here, right? Yep. You're definitely improving the customer experience and you know reducing their workloads. Yep. So, uh, well, yeah. yeah, it means that because we have serverless, as Andrew said, we have serverless, so we have more capacity as we need it. And for us, it really means that you know we don't need more capacity. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, time for a vacation, right? You need. You've been hard at work, and once you ship these updates, you can. Schedule your own vacation of a lifetime yep. and not get charged six times for your flight toll. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. So, all right. Well, uh, thank you.